This month's Patreon choice is to cover a unit of smaller craft as opposed to a single larger vessel. So let's take a look at US Navy Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3. At the outbreak of World War II, the unit was based in Cavite or Cavite in the Philippines, which, along with the rest of the country, had been under US control since the time of the Spanish American War when it had been taken from Spain's colonial empire. The unit was made up ostensibly of a dozen vessels, of which PT-31 through 35, along with squadron flagship PT-41, were in the Philippines, whilst the other half were still in Pearl Harbor. The unit was equipped with the second variant of the PT-20, or ALCO 77-foot class of torpedo boat, which had been tested initially in competition and proven fast, but lightly built and liable to damage itself even in moderate seas. However, structural train changes and uprated engines meant that by the time of World War II, the 40-ton boats could now make over 40 knots in top speed, driven by three 1,500-horsepower V12 petrol engines, each of which was connected to its own propeller. As early models, their armament consisted of four single torpedo tubes equipped with the older Mark 8 torpedo, a twin 50 cal mounting, and a twin 303 Lewis gun mounting. The 50 cals came in their own little plexiglass turret. This was something that was soon replaced on most PT boats in the fleet once war was declared, but out on the immediate front lines, this change was not immediately possible. Armour, given that these were small wooden boats, consisted largely of going very fast, thoughts and prayers, and a good old-fashioned harsh language. Each boat had a notional crew of 15 officers and men, which gave the deployed half of the squadron a theoretical seagoing complement of 90 in total, although apparently only 84 of them were present at the end of 1941, since crew requirements on PT boats could vary slightly depending on the boat and its precise weapons loadout. Anything from 12 to 20 crew were common in certain areas. Once war had broken out, the base was no longer ideal due to facing a large-scale air assaults from the Japanese, something to which the boats, with their lack of armour, were especially vulnerable. And so, salvaging what they could from the burning remains of the base, they went over to Sisamon Bay to assist with the defence of Bataan and Corregidor. On the way, they would fight off attacking Japanese aircraft using their machine guns, and as the Japanese began their invasion, they would use a tug which had been emergency inducted into the US Navy as a base ship, working in concert with some old destroyers and a few converted yachts to form an ad hoc patrol group as part of the relatively small US Asiatic force. It was this small force that then formed the primary naval resistance to the Japanese invasion. They couldn't possibly hope to confront the Japanese Navy directly, but they could go places that anything other than a practically undefended landing barge could not, and from here they could make night sorties and pick away at vulnerable transports, landing craft and the like, as well as providing fire support for embattled US troops, rescue missions for cut-off units, downed pilots, and the crews of damaged and destroyed merchant and military vessels, as well as delaying various Japanese assaults by fighting small duels with lesser Japanese escort ships, holding up assaults long enough for friendly troops to try and redeploy or begin a withdrawal. There was one particular mission where they had great success cutting up a bunch of unescorted landing craft, causing heavy casualties amongst the Japanese attackers. However, it wasn't all going their way. PT-33 was an early casualty, only lasting about a week before being lost in Subic Bay, and PT-31 suffered a similar fate in late January 1942 after just a month and a half of combat operations. The craft were also wearing out their machinery, guns and supplies at a very rapid rate, not helped by problems with their fuel, possibly as a result of sabotage. But by March 1942, it was pretty clear that the Japanese were going to successfully take the islands, and so the remaining four boats were given new orders to get General MacArthur, his family, and a number of other staff officers off of Corregidor and away to safety. Overnight, they would make a journey of over 560 miles, dodging through Japanese patrol lines to reach Midanao in the south of the Philippines, from which MacArthur and his staff could be flown out by airplane. 
this wasn't without loss. PT-32 suffered an engine fire and had to be abandoned during the first part of the journey, as waiting long enough for it to attempt repairs would have risked exposing the entire unit to air attack, as they would still have been at sea by daybreak. So the crew and passengers were taken off, and the boat was left behind. The surviving three boats would stay at Midanao, with PT-41 and PT-34 making a textbook assault on the Japanese cruiser Kuma and an accompanying torpedo boat, but unfortunately, faulty torpedoes in the US Navy arsenal were not limited to just the Mark 14, and the hit scored on Kuma was amongst around 200 duds recorded during the Philippines campaign. This action would also mark the end of the squadron, as the next day PT-34 was attacked by a formation of float planes which had been launched from a seaplane carrier and the Kuma herself. Although PT-34 managed to down one of the aircraft with machine gun fire, the return fire, as well as blast and shrapnel from bombs that hit nearby, began to take their toll on the crew and started poking holes in the boat. With two crew dead and everyone else injured, the survivors swam for the shore as PT-34 detonated under fire from the returning aircraft. Some of the crew would make it out safely, but others would be captured by the Japanese. PT-35 was soon after caught out by advancing troops and had to be scuttled to avoid capture, and the remaining ship, the flagship PT-41, was taken over by the US Army, who intended to use it to defend a lake. But within the week, she had also been scuttled, as the positions around the lake were also overrun. Of the 84 men present in December 1941, by May 1942, 18 had died in action, with 38 captured, along with another seven who'd been unable to rejoin US forces and went to ground as guerrilla fighters, leaving a total of 21 able to continue service, of which the squadron commander, L Lieutenant Bulk Bulkerly, and four officers would make it out by plane. Bulkerly would be reassigned to a new command that consisted of more P PT boats and would eventually find himself helping minesweepers clear lanes onto Utah Beach on D-Day, followed by command of the destroyer USS Endicott. A post-war would see him land a number of roles, including the unenviable task of being in charge of Guantanamo Naval Base in Cuba at the time of the communist takeover. He would eventually retire in 1988 from the US Navy, with a Medal of Honor, a Navy Cross, the Army Distinguished Cross with Oak Leaf Cluster, meaning that he'd actually won it twice, the Legion of Merit, the Philippine Distinguished Conduct Star, the Combat V, the French Croix de Guerre, two Purple Hearts, and two Silver Stars, along with presumably a distinct list to port. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.